By July of 2020, as I'm preparing this episode of Esoterica, COVID-19 has affected the lives of most people on this planet. It is difficult to understand the scale and long-term impact of such an epidemic on the lives and cultures of what already seems like a fragile state of world affairs. History reveals that disease has long been a menace to human life and will likely remain so, barring some radical technological innovation. History also reveals that human beings have proven nothing short of ingenious in the ways that they have learned to predict, combat, survive, and overcome previous epidemics. We too should be commended for our everyday acts of persistence, survival, and creativity in the face of something truly terrible. Even clicking through YouTube channels to pass the time is still a future-facing act of endurance and steadfastness. The way out is through. I think that's a Nine Inch Nails song. Of the many ways people have sought to endure and combat sickness and disease through the ages has been through magic. Of course, the boundaries between magic, religion, and medicine have proven utterly porous through the ages, and attempting to make a sharp distinction between them simply misreads history. In this episode of Esoterica, we're going to take a tiny survey of some of the medico-magical techniques people have employed through the ages, from the dawn of civilization to the advent of modernity to combat disease. From exorcisms to amulets to sigils to bending the rules of orthodox religion, let's explore how people through the ages may have fought coronavirus using their own magical technologies. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. Civilization arose in the ancient Near East, and with the domestication of animals and increased population density came disease and epidemic. Such outbreaks are described very early in literature, and often accompany the compounding horrors of war, another side effect of surplus wealth and resource accumulation. In the Mesopotamian cradle of civilization, disease was apparently common, and medico magic was long employed to combat it. The most common cause of illness in this culture was taken to be either divine wrath, demonic powers, and vengeful ghosts. We get a glimpse of this anti-demonic or anti-ghost exorcistic magic from a small set of anti-fever amulets discovered at Nippur and date from the second half of the first millennium BCE. What we have is a barrel-shaped amulet made in clay, probably meant to be worn around the neck of the person suffering from this illness. The incantation here is bracketed by the word in, a Sumerian word meaning priest, probably indicating either the person who made the amulet or the vessel through which the amulet has its power. It appears that this person is suffering from some long-term illness. Here we have a girl or a woman attacked by a fever, which has also had some further effect on her body. Similarly, we also have reports during the Black Death that the disease somehow made the body repugnant to smell, though it's not clear just what kind of illness she's suffering from. The god invoked here is Ea, a creator god, a god of magic and mischief, but also a god who is known to create through fevers themselves. Thus, if he has power over fevers, he can be implored to cast one out. The concept here is basically exorcism, and the origin of the fever is taken to be supernatural. The task of the medical expert here is to cast out the fever as if they were a demon or a ghost. In fact, it's probably the case that the fever was thought of as a kind of demon or ghost. It's important to recall here that we're reading the names of real people suffering from a real illness, reaching out to a god that they thought is just as real as the god that perhaps you believe in, seeking an end to suffering of someone they loved thousands of years ago. Illness demons are a persistent feature of the earliest civilizations. When the prophet Habakkuk wanted to fill his audience with the dread of the Israelite god, he vividly describes the divine being as piloting a kind of chariot driven by two dread horses of Reshef, literally burning, probably fever, and Dever, plague. This image combines both the terror of war and the fear of epidemic into a single powerful symbol. But note, at least, if it's the case that God wields both plague and fever, that through their mercy there may yet be hope. One of the greatest collections of spellcraft from the ancient world are the Greek magical papyri. This vast collection of Greco-Egyptian magic represents a wide swath of magical spells and technologies, but two concerns seem to predominate. One is the desire to find love, and the other is to escape disease. One interesting spell can be found at PGM 106 lines 1 through 10. This spell engages the full gamut of magical power into an amulet to protect its user from quote, every shivering fit and fever. A couple of things about this spell jump out to me. First, the patient of this amulet is a certain Tuthos, named after the Egyptian god Toth, himself the ibis-headed god of writing and magic. With such a name, we can likely infer that this person is an indigenous Egyptian. 
and likely a follower of that religion. Yet, the spell is fascinating because it invokes the Jewish god and Jewish angelic beings. This spell is also interesting because of the range of magical technologies involved. Here we have imagery such as the Ouroboros, or the tail-consuming serpent, the use of magical characters and powerful words, including a pretty famous magical palindrome which is likely of Hebrew origin. The religious syncretism and range of magical devices at work in this reveal to me a singular truth. When we or our loved ones fall ill, we don't act by half measures. We use every technology we have access to, and we may not be picky about just what God does the healing. Disease evolved, and so did the magic to combat it. While the gods of the ancient world were eclipsed by the monotheism of Christianity and Islam, the panoply of demons only seemed to increase. Galenic medicine became widespread, Greek philosophy and science were adapted and improved in Islamic lands, specifically the science of astrology flourished and underwent further modification. Along with imbalanced humors, the sickening air theory or the miasma theory of illness, and demonic possession came the idea that rays streaming down through the heavens caused epidemics. Luckily, philosophers and scientists like Alkindi taught that the influence of the stars could also be captured and manipulated to combat the illnesses brought on by the stellar rays. This magical technology eventually made its way to Europe. Albertus Magnus, the teacher of none less than Thomas Aquinas, tells us in his book on minerals that if one were to ascribe certain images upon certain types of stones at certain opportune astrological times, that these talismans have the ability to prevent and repel sickness. Here we have the use of, for instance, jasper being carved at certain opportune times with certain kinds of images has the ability to combat fever. This is an example of the combined use of both astrology and natural magic in the efforts to combat illness. Of course, this idea would have proven very popular as the Black Death reached Europe in the mid-14th century. From divine wrath to anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, which we've outgrown, right? The Great Mortality, as it was called then, had many proposed causes. In Paris, one of the most learned and oldest universities in Europe, the doctors there rejected that the plague was a result of divine wrath, and therefore self-flagellation was not the order of the day. Rather, they proposed, using the best science of their day, that the plague was the result of a very complex astrological confluence. Regardless of what one thinks about astrology, it must be admitted here that the doctors of Paris are bringing to bear the best astronomical, mathematical, meteorological, and medical knowledge of their day in order to provide a purely natural explanation for what's going on with the plague. For them, just as the moon affects the tides, so the planets are also affecting the aerial tides, therefore precipitating the diseased air which causes the plague. It is also worth noting that the natural magic described by Albert the Great a century prior would have been an utterly logical attempt to counteract this astral-born epidemic. One only wonders how many Paris doctors carried gems beneath their cloaks. A century after Europe settled a mere armistice with the Black Death, a Middle English ritualist can be seen to bend the rules of orthodoxy a bit. Of course, when God doesn't seem to hear our prayers, we may hedge our bets. And we see that in a medieval manuscript held in the Trinity Library at Cambridge. Here we have a charm in which the Eucharistic host is slightly modified, along with the addition of Latin phrases and prescribed prayers over a three-day period. Here we have a typical Christian ritual being modified to specifically target a fever-bearing illness. There's nothing obviously diabolical at work here, but this is in fact a kind of para-religious magic. It is an expanded Christian ritual with further magical implications. Of course, recourse to diabolical forces did persist, and manuals of black magic are to be found here and there. Perhaps the most famous is the Key of Solomon, a book of magic still popular with occultists to this very day. The text itself details a very complex set of purifications, conjurations, and magical seals. One of those seals, a pentacle of Mars, quote, serves with great success against all kinds of diseases if it be applied to the afflicted part. Along with this magical healing power, the sigil also reveals a syncretistic streak. While the language here is Hebrew, the name down the center is in fact Yehoshua, Joshua, or Jesus. And the words around the border are in fact a quotation from the Gospel of John translated into Hebrew. Here we have an astral talisman employing the sacred language of the Jewish people, but borrowing from Christianity. Unsurprisingly, the pentacles from this magical textbook are actually sold out in many of the places I checked online especially those said to be cast under auspicious astrological conditions. Of course, Jewish magic also contains a wealth of incantations and amulets, or kamayot, against illness and disease. The most famous text of Jewish magic is probably the Sefer Raziel HaMalach, or the Book of the Angel Raziel, Raziel is Hebrew for the secret of God, printed in the early 18th century in Amsterdam. There, one finds a long, complex amulet invoking powerful angels against all manner of evil, especially disease. This amulet protects, interestingly enough, by the use of the mother's name, similar to Jewish prayers of healing, and reaching all the way back to our Greco-Egyptian spell. The mother's name on that amulet, you may recall, was Sarah, perhaps a Jewish name. 
This is just a tiny glimpse into the incredibly rich world of anti-disease amulets, charms, spells, and forms of magic to be found at every point in history in practically every culture. What is laid bare is what is common to us all. Human frailty, the fear of sickness, and the deep desire to cure ourselves and our loved ones. Magic has been marshaled to our aid since the beginning of history, through the waves of devastating plagues, and surely will persist long into the future. And for that reason, among others, magic deserves the careful attention of scholars and anyone else who seeks to understand and appreciate the human condition. I hope that you and your loved ones stay safe during these trying times. If you're interested in the history of magic, make sure to subscribe. It's one of the core focuses here at Esoterica. We focus on magical texts, famous figures in the history of magic, the history of magical theory, and more. And perhaps you'll consider supporting our work on Patreon or with a one-time donation. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.